Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are talking about bradykinin-induced vasodilatation. Okay, so in the previous video what we saw is that when we stimulate an endothelial cell with bradykinin, it's going to activate B2 receptors in the membrane of that endothelial cell, which is going to lead to the activation of the alpha QGTP subunit. And the alpha QGTP is going to lead to the activation of phospholipase C beta, which is going to break down phosphatidyl inositol 4 5 bisphosphate into diacylglyceride and inositol 1 4 5 trisphosphate or IP3. Now, I want to draw out my endothelial cell again because I want to remind you of something that I told you earlier, which is that this signal is a global signal. So if this is our endothelial cell, basically we have doused this entire endothelial uh, cell surface membrane, or at least this portion that faces the lumen of the blood vessel, we have doused it with uh, bradykinin. So we are getting the signaling cascade happening all over the place. So basically IP3 is going up everywhere in the cell. You're getting IP3 being produced everywhere. Now, what does IP3 do? Well, IP3 is going to trigger the release of calcium from the intracellular stores. So let's draw the intracellular stores all over the cell. And there are in intracellular calcium stores all over the cell. We will draw this very crudely with a single endoplasmic reticulum spanning the entire cell. Okay, so this, this intracellular organelle that I've drawn here, this represents the endo plasmic reticulum, which is often just denoted ER for short. Now the endoplasmic reticulum is an intracellular store of calcium. It's one of the main intracellular stores of calcium. There are others, uh, but uh, they're a little bit more niche uh, and esoteric knowledge. Okay, so the endoplasmic reticulum is a major store of calcium, so it has calcium inside it. Now, the calcium concentration in the cytoplasm of the cell is very, very low. So, calcium concentration in the cytoplasm of the cell is generally around 100 nanomolar, okay? So, you can trigger major changes inside the cytoplasm of the cell by raising calcium concentration, and you can raise calcium concentration considerably by releasing it from the intracellular stores. Now, in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, which I'll draw here, there are receptors for IP3, known cunningly as the IP3 receptors. The IP3 receptors, which I'll draw out um, in, uh, I'll draw them in a bigger picture in a moment. I'll just colour them in a certain colour so we know exactly what we're talking about here. So these pink structures that I'm drawing here, these are representing these IP3 receptors, okay? And you've got them in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Now let's take a look at the... Well, actually, I'll just label them up first before we take a look at their more in-depth um, in structure. So this is an IP3 receptor. Now let's take a look at their more in-depth structure. So let's draw one of these a bit bigger. Okay, so here is an IP3 receptor bigger. It's bumped up. Okay, so the IP3 receptors are a uh, tetramer, basically. So they're made up of four proteins, like so. Okay, now, there are three genes in the human genome which can code for proteins which can be used to make up a quarter of the IP3 receptor. So each one of these quarters, there are three proteins that you can use to make that quarter, basically. So, there are three genes in the human genome coding for these subunits that make up the IP3 receptor, okay? And when you make a tetramer like this, when you join four of them together, you can either join four that have been uh, made from the same gene to make what's known as a homo tetramer, i.e. four of the same protein have been put together to make a tetramer, make a functional IP3 receptor. So this is an IP3 receptor. Okay. Or you can actually mix and match. You can use different genes in different sockets, basically. That's what's known as a hetero tetramer. Okay. So they still make 
functional IP3 receptors. Now, uh, the IP3 receptors, another fun fact about them, is that they are massive, absolutely massive. Each one of these quarter subunits uh, has around 2,750 amino acids, which is often denoted just as alpha-alpha for amino acids. Okay, so they are big proteins because, you know, this receptor is four of those put together, so it's four times that size, so it's a massive, great protein. Now what I want to discuss is what IP3 is going to do to these receptors, because it's a common misconception that IP3 is going to actually cause them to open. It's more subtle than that. It, they, it does. If you look at the bigger picture, it does. But it's more subtle what it actually does to them than just causes them to open. So, let's have a look at this IP3 receptor from the top view here. Okay, so it's made up of these four different uh, subunits that have come together in this tetramer here. Okay, now, um, before IP3 binds to the receptor, the IP3 receptor has exposed an inhibitory calcium binding site. Okay, uh, so in orange, this is uh, supposed to represent an inhibitory calcium binding site. So this is an inhibitory calcium binding site. So, if calcium comes along and binds to this inhibitory calcium binding site, what will happen is it will reduce the probability that the receptor is in the open conformation even further. So, um, the IP3 receptor is not very likely to be open at all anyway, but if you now bind calcium to the inhibitory calcium binding sites, um, then basically it will be even less likely to be in the open conformation and allowing calcium to move through it. So because there are four subunits making up the IP3 receptor, each one of them has an inhibitory calcium binding site. Now, each one of these uh, IP3 receptor subunits also has an IP3 binding domain, which I'll draw in pink here. Okay, so in pink, this denotes the IP3 binding domain here. Okay, so let me label this up. This denotes the IP3 binding domain. Okay, so what can now happen is that IP3 can come and bind to these IP3 binding domains. And because you have four IP3 binding domains, because you have four subunits, you're going to need four IP3 molecules to come in, one to come into each IP3 binding domain. Now, if IP3 binds to these IP3 binding domains, what happens is it changes the conformation of these proteins and does not, does not cause them to open the channel. Instead, what it causes, okay, is them to change conformation so that this inhibitory calcium binding site is no longer exposed. And instead, a stimulatory calcium binding site becomes exposed. So here are the IP3 binding sites again, and now these inhibitory calcium binding sites in orange have disappeared, and instead there is now a stimulatory calcium binding site shown here in green, which is exposed. So this represents the stimulatory calcium binding site. Stimulatory calcium binding site. Now, if calcium comes and binds to these stimulatory calcium binding sites, and again, you have four subunits, so you have four stimulatory calcium binding sites, so you're going to need four calcium ions to come and bind. If calcium comes and binds to these stimulatory calcium binding sites, uh, then, then, finally, the IP3 receptor will open. So, what does IP3 actually do to these IP3 receptors? It primes them. It basically takes them from being in a conformation where they'll be inhibited by calcium to being in a conformation where they'll be stimulated by calcium to open. So it puts them in a state where they can open, but it doesn't alone actually open them. Okay, now, where does the calcium come from that's going to actually bind to these stimulatory calcium binding sites? Because so far, what's happened is um, we have raised IP3 levels globally in the cell because we've had this global bradykinin signal. 
That means all of the IP3 receptors, all the way along this endoplasmic reticulum here, have all got IP3 bound to them, and they are primed and ready to go. All they are waiting for is calcium to come and bind to their stimulatory calcium binding sites, and they will then open. Okay, but where does the calcium come from? Well, this is a bit of a mystery. Some people believe that there must also be some sort of channel in the uh, membrane of the cell which opens in response to the bradykinin potentially or opens in response to some other stimulus but that there must be a calcium channel in the cell membrane so I'll denote this in blue this is a bit of a mystery though um, we don't know if this exists but some people believe that you must have a calcium um, entry from the extracellular fluid that is then going to come and bind uh, to one of these IP3 receptors here and cause it to open, basically. Alternatively, potentially, the calcium could just have come from the intracellular fluid. You don't have a zero concentration of calcium. Yes, it's tiny. You've got a concentration of 100 nanomolar, but that's not zero by any stretch of the imagination. So it's not impossible that four calcium ions could just happen to bind to one of these primed IP3 receptors and where these calcium ions just came from the cytoplasm. One of these two happens, basically. And what happens is that the calcium will come and bind to just one of these IP3 receptors, maybe, bind to its stimulatory calcium binding sites. And what that causes is that IP3 receptor, which was primed by the IP3 and now activated by the calcium, to open. And when it opens, it's going to allow calcium to leave the endoplasmic reticulum. So what you'll get is you'll get calcium going up in the vicinity of that IP3 receptor that has opened. Okay, So here's a little sort of spike of calcium. This yellow represents that the calcium is going up in that little region. Okay, I hope you can see that. Uh, now, um, what is going to happen is that the calcium is going to spill over from this portion of the cytoplasm nearby this IP3 receptor onto its neighbours. So some of this calcium is going to spill over onto its neighbour over here. And when that calcium arrives on its neighbour, it's going to bind to the stimulatory calcium binding sites of this primed IP3 receptor. Because remember I said IP3 has gone up globally, so all of the IP3 receptors have IP3 bound to them effectively. And uh, now they're all just waiting for a calcium signal. Now some of the calcium has spilled over from its neighbour here onto it, and that's going to cause it to open. So it's going to open. It's going to let calcium out of the endoplasmic reticulum. So what will happen is you'll get calcium coming up here. Okay. And then what will happen is that, oh, the calcium that's been let out by this one will spill over onto the next one, bind to its stimulatory calcium binding sites, and it will uh, release calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. So you'll get calcium going up in the vicinity of this IP3 receptor. So basically what you get is a spreading release of calcium. This concept is known as a calcium wave. Okay. So when you get global signals in IP3, when IP3 goes up in an entire cell, what you get is these calcium waves because all of the IP3 receptors are activated. Oh, well, are primed and ready to go if only they receive calcium. Now, uh, we'll continue this discussion in the next video.